Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. When we encounter other people in this world, we encounter them by their external appearance. And in many religions, you can tell what religion a person is by their external appearance. For instance, a Christian may wear a cross. A Hindu may have a mark on his forehead. A Muslim may wear a cap or a hijab. Different religions have different clothing that signify who they are. And we recognize them by their clothing. We recognize them by some kind of external appearance. But Allah does not see us that way. Allah does not see us by our external appearances. God doesn't see us externally. God sees us internally. God knows the devotion that exists within our heart. God knows the qualities that exist within our heart. God is not interested in the external appearances. God is interested on who we are internally and how we are internally. Man doesn't have that same interest. One, man can't see inside somebody else to tell who they are. So what man does, he forms assumptions by what is going on on the outside. He forms assumptions by the differences that he sees externally. And we have created society around these external differences. And we have forgotten that the truth of man is not their external differences, but the truth of man is their internal qualities and who they are internally. But we don't look at people that way. We are satisfied in looking at them externally and in creating differences by way of these external appearances. In multicultural societies like Toronto, you will see people from many, many different cultures walking in the streets together. You'll see Pakistanis who are Muslim. You'll see Hindus from India. You'll see Sikhs from India. You'll see Muslims. You'll see all kinds of different people. Canada has learned how to maintain a semblance of civility amongst all these different peoples. A lot of places in the world have not learned how to maintain civility amongst all these different people. One of the things that we, as people trying to go on the Sufi path, we have to stop looking at differences and look at similarities. We have to begin to understand the nature of the similarities among all of us and 
recognize the God within us and the qualities within us. But for people who only see external things, uh, a Christian who sees a Muslim only sees a Muslim. He doesn't see the devotion in the heart to God. When the Muslim looks at the Christian, he sees a Christian. He doesn't see the devotion in the heart to God. When the Christian looks at a Hindu, he sees a Hindu, but he doesn't see the devotion inside to God. When he looks at a Buddhist, he doesn't see the devotion inside the heart to God. So we should understand that to see the devotion to God within people is beyond the ability of our eyes, beyond the ability of our senses. But it's not beyond Allah's ability, because that is all that Allah looks for. As we begin to be able to do away with the differences between ourselves and other people, we can become closer to seeing the devotion within people to God. We come closer to seeing that God exists within each person. So if we see somebody in Buddhist garb, we see the God within them. If we see somebody in Hindu garb, we see the God within them. If we see somebody in Muslim garb, we see the God within them. Hindu garb, the God within them. Jewish garb, the God within them. The garb no longer creates a separation between ourselves and other people. And the religion no longer creates a separation between ourselves and other people. So we have to let go of the pride and arrogance of our own religion in order to be able to accept all religions. We can do things our own way. We can do our rituals in our own way, but it doesn't mean that we need to denigrate others. It doesn't need, mean that we need to judge others and the way that they do things. The Quran says that when you meet a non-believer, for instance, it is your duty to advise. Now, advice is a verbal communication to try and bring about change. It does not lead to the level of compulsion. The Quran also says there is no compulsion in religion. Allah needs people to voluntarily come to Him. Allah wants people to fall in love with him. Allah wants people to come to him on their own volition, not through the volition of a sword or a gun or a whip. And any conversion that is done under duress is not a true conversion. You can't force people internally to believe. You can make them wear the garb of a religion. You can make them take on the outer aspects of a religion, but you can't create that love within them for God, for Allah, for the Supreme Being. This happens because of a person's inclination. And that inclination is brought about through kindness, through love, and through advice. It's not brought, brought about through compulsion. 
Now, we, inshallah, God willing, have all taken the step to become believers. We've all taken the step to believe that Allah is one, God is one, and there is this one God for all of humanity, and this one God is a God that cannot be seen, but is known through his qualities and through his gracious nature, through his truth, through his justice, through his mercy, through his compassion. The question that comes to each of us, and the one that we have to look at closely, is what is the degree of certitude in our faith towards this God? What is the degree of certitude that we actually believe in him? And to what extent do we believe in the illusory world? So you have these two belief systems, a belief system in the illusory world and a belief system in the majesty of Allah, the greatness of Allah, and the fact that Allah is all-knowing and all-competent and capable of much more than we can imagine, whose strength and power and omnipotence is greater than our imagination can conceive. We believe that he knows all and can do all, yet we still have this tendency to believe in what we see, to believe in this illusory world and to interact with this illusory world. So we have faith, but what is the degree of our faith? What is the certitude of our faith? When Abraham was thrown into the pit of fire, his certitude was that Allah would save him. And there was no question that that would occur. When Abraham was told to sacrifice his son, Allah's word was sufficient for him, and he moved forward to do that. All of the prophets had certitude that was without doubt. They had certitude that took them beyond their connection to the illusory world. They had certitude that there was a greater knowing than the knowing that comes to us from our senses. That there is something beyond what we can comprehend to our senses and that this something else is greater than anything that we can comprehend with our senses. So, question, do you believe that? Do you believe that Allah's treasures are greater than any treasures that are available in this physical world? And do you live your life as if that were true? Do you live your life as if the world to come is more important to us than this world that we live in that is elemental, 
that is here for a specific period of time. We are constantly given moral dilemmas. Can we do something that will advance us in this physical world, yet pull us back, hinder us as to our entering into the grace of Allah in the next world? Do we give that thought? Do we separate the two? Can we tell the difference and on what side of that equation do we fall when these moral dilemmas reach us? We need to be steadfast in our faith. And steadfast in our faith means that the qualities that cause us problems in this world, the drama that causes us problems in this world, the sorrow that causes us problems in this world, don't affect us because our overriding faith in our Lord is so great that we understand that the problems of this world are of no consequence to him and of no consequence in truth to us as long as our faith in him is strong. Can we live a life without doubt in our Lord's supremacy? Can we live a life without doubt in our Lord's ability to take care of whatever situation we are in? Can we live a life where we are willing to surrender to his will, or do we constantly need to impose our will in situations because we believe that we know the answer to things and we know the way to resolve situations. Do we understand that all resolution is in his hands? Do we understand that all outcomes are in his hands? Or do we believe that we are the ones who fashion our own life and fashion our own existence. It needs to be understood that we have a lot to do with the creation of our situation. We have a lot to do with the drama that we're in because of our involvement in this world and the way that we are involved in this world. We are constantly pulled by the lower self and its desires in this physical world. And what this does is it has an impetus to push us to resolving those desires. And it's in the resolution of the desires that are created by our own lower self as to things that we think we need, that all of the drama in this world arises. Imagine if you are without desire. Imagine if your needs have been extremely limited. Imagine if your dependence is on Allah. In other words, you go about your daily life doing the things that you're supposed to do, putting in all of the effort that you can, but you are cognizant at all times 
that your success or failure is not in your hands. It's in Allah's hands, and you are satisfied with whatever outcome happens. This need that we have for outcome to come in a certain way, to be presented to us in this drama life in a certain way, is one of the reasons that we are in difficulty all the time. We have expectations. And when we have these expectations, unless these expectations are fulfilled, we somehow feel that we are lacking. We somehow feel that we don't have enough. And through expectations that are unfulfilled, we are caused sorrow. But if we can detach ourselves from expectations, we can detach ourselves from sorrow. Now, this equation isn't always evident to everybody, but if you look at things very closely, if you detach yourself from expectations, one of the results is you detach yourself from the sorrow of unfulfilled expectations. We need to allow our life to move forward without insisting that certain things happen each step of the way. We have to be able to accept God's perfection even though we don't understand God's perfection. There is a Sufi proverb that says basically, everything is in perfection. The problem is our inability to see perfection and to act on perfection when it is right in front of us. In other words, we don't know what perfection is. And why don't we know? Because we haven't reached a level of perfection within ourselves. And why haven't we done that? Because we haven't given up our desire and we haven't given up our attachment to the egocentric I, to the I self, to the separate self. So somehow we need to be able to include humanity, all of humanity, with us when we say I. And that's why we say we instead of I, because the I is a separate distinction, while the we is an inclusive unity. In truth, there is but one I, and that is Allah. He called himself, I am that I am. We can't say that. We are other than that. We are part of the great unity of existence. In the beginning, when Allah was coming from his deep meditation, he created from himself the nur. And the nur was the light that came from him that was in conversation with him. And this nur is sometimes referred to as the nur Muhammad, the light that represents the archetype for what a human is supposed to be. And we are the creation that represents that archetype. And the question is, to what extent do we actually represent that archetype? Are we capable of being in communion with our Lord, or are we too busy being 
in communion with this physical world and all of its manifestations to take the time to leave that and be in communion with our Lord. This has to do with the extent of the certitude that we have within us as to the reality of God, as to the reality of what we can't see, as to the reality of the gracious qualities that are God, as to the reality of mercy and compassion, as to the reality of truth and justice, as to the reality of seeing beyond the garb of humanity to see the inner functioning of humanity in its connection to our Lord. Every one of our hearts contains God. And when we look at each other, do we see the God within the other man, or do we see the outer appearance and react to that? Can we go beyond appearances? Can we go beyond the outer manifestation of things to understand the truth that is in reality? What is the extent of our respect for the truth? What is the extent of our obedience to the, to the truth? There was a holy man who lived in a certain province in India. And the Maharaja of that province did things that made it impossible for him to live there any longer. So he decided to go to another province, which was quite a bit away. And the Maharaja of the other province had heard that he was coming to his province. So he decided he had to do something for this great, wise, holy man who was coming to live in his land. And he decided to have a chair brought to the border so that when he crossed the border of the province, they could put the holy man in there and bring him to the Maharaja's home. So when the holy man came into the province, there was a chair waiting for him, and they sat him in the chair, and they carried him the hundred or so miles to the Maharaja's palace. And the holy man expected to meet the Maharaja when he got to the palace, but there was no one there to greet him. And he said, where is the Maharaja? And the Maharaja said, it is I, I have been carrying you this whole way. Now, can you imagine the king made himself the carrier? The king humbled himself to be the one who carried the chair to bring him to the palace. To what extent do we humble ourselves before God? To what extent do we make ourselves small in front of God? To what extent do we understand the great, magnificent, overwhelming power that is constantly surrounding us, that we are intermingled with, and yet we spend so much time ignoring because of our fascination with the creation as opposed to the creator. It comes down to the level of certitude within our own being as to our relationship with God. Can we believe even though we do not see? Is our faith strong enough 
to govern our actions in an appropriate manner towards our creator, even though we cannot see our creator. Is our obedience to the prophets and the message that they brought strong enough to carry us in this world in obedience to their directives and in obeisance to our Lord? Can we praise him constantly, even though we don't see him? Can we grasp his treasures and the greatness of those treasures and the overwhelming superiority of those treasures to the things of this world? Or do the sparkles and the hypnotisms and the fireworks of creation hypnotize us into ardor and lust for those things? Can we give up our innate inclination to be drawn to the physical world? You see, within us, we have so many things that are magnetized to illusion. We have so many things that when illusion comes at us, we push and are pulled in that direction. This is the war that we have to fight within us. This inclination of the elements within us to join the elements outside of us has to be overcome so that we can go beyond that which is elemental and transcend into the qualities that are unseen yet are what keeps creation in being. Can we believe that and is our certitude strong enough to overcome the pull of the world and the pull of the magnetisms within the world? We have constantly got to ask ourselves this question, and we have constantly got to look at the state of our certitude. How real is God to us? How real is our inner devotion? How strong is the compassion within us so that we can see beyond external differences, that we can see beyond external garb, that we can see beyond the names given to different peoples? Are we strong enough to see beyond differences, even though differences have been hammered into us since we were children? Are we strong enough to see beyond caste systems, to see beyond color, to see beyond language, to see beyond religion, to see reality, which is beyond all of these things, which is the light that comes from inside of us that can illuminate this entire world. It's said that when Rabia prayed, a light came from inside of her heart that illuminated the area that she was in. She didn't need a lamp to read. God's light provided the light for her to see in the darkness. We have access to that light. We have access to that reality. We need to increase our certitude so that we truly believe that we have access to that, so that we truly intend that that come about. If our belief system is lacking, if we don't believe things can happen in certain ways, for us, no matter what reality is, for us, 
the outcome will be what we believe. Now, that may not be reality. So our outcome may be other than reality. Our outcome may be limited to illusion. Our outcome may be limited to the illusory sensations of the world. And what that does is it stifles our very soul. It stifles our doorway to reality because we don't believe that that reality exists. So each of us has to take on a belief system that allows reality to exist. Each of us has to take on a belief system that allows God to exist within us. Now, the truth is that that's what's going on anyway. So either we believe the truth, as all of the prophets have told us, as all of the Ketubs have told us, as all of the wise ones have told us, or we fight that because we are so enamored by ourselves and our interaction and power within this illusory world. Part of life is the compact with death. That which is born must also die. We have to make our stand with that which is eternal. If we make the stand for this existence with ourselves, we are making a stand with that which is temporary. We have to make a stand with that which is eternal. We have to ride that which is eternal to eternity. The choice is within us. It is said that we have free will. This is our only choice, whether to go with that which dies or go with that which doesn't die. This is our only choice. Now, it is difficult to choose the path towards the eternal because we can't see the eternal. So, so many people become satisfied with the treasures of this world, wealth, fame, power, lust, and all of them are wrapped in delusion and illusion. And when you see older people still fighting to make their way in this world, it has to make you wonder, am I going to be that way? Am I going to be able to finally take the stand with truth? Or am I doomed to live a life as I and nothing more? And when the I disappears, does that mean my reality disappears? We have to ask ourselves these questions, and we have to take a stand with God. Each of the prophets spent their life trying to promote this message. The Ketubs spent their life promoting this message. This is what the teachers do. They give their life to promote this message so that their life can be eternal. We should take this message on and apply it to ourselves and bring this message into our life and then bring it into the life of everyone that we can bring it into in a kind, loving way. We need to be able to see beyond differences and understand the unity of all men in creation and the unity of men with their Lord. And we have to ask Allah to allow us to be able to see this. Open up our hearts so that we can see the light of your truth and the truth of your nature. Open up our hearts so reality 
becomes self-evident to us. Stop all that is hidden from us from being seen and allow us to see truth. Allow us to make the connection to truth. Allow us to come into your purview. Allow us to be among those who are considered your friends who spend time with you, Allah. Open up your reality to us. Open up the truth to us. Take us to that place that is so near to all of us so that we can merge within truth. Make it happen for us, Allah. This is our prayer. This is our intention. Amin, amin. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.